Welcome to Deep Dive MH370, episode 20, bringing in the experts. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy Tarnoff. I'm the publisher. I'm the founder of On Milwaukee, a daily magazine and media company based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I am once again joined by Jeff Wise, aviation expert, author of The Taking of MH370. And you may by now probably definitely already know him from the Netflix documentary MH370, The Plane That Disappeared. Jeff is also a man with a tremendous amount of joie de vivre when it comes <laughs> to MH370. As you know, I'm trying to weave in a little bit of French in every one of these things. And Jeff, honestly, this is like the most excited I've seen you in weeks. Something something must have happened in the last week to get you fired up for this thing. Andy, that is true. Um, I don't know if it's excitement or sleep deprivation. I got, sometimes I get, I, I am a man of the rabbit hole and sometimes I go into it and I start, and the, the pieces start to fall together and it's very exciting. Basically, um, I've been writing and thinking about this stuff and talking to people about it for a decade now, as you know, and I've talked to a lot of marine biologists over the years, um, but, and, and, and I sort of try to process what they've told me and regurgitate it back out. And, and, and I've said things to you and you're like, well, is that your theory? Or is that just what other people think too? And I'm like, you know what? We need to not, you not, you need to not hear it from me. You need to hear it from the actual experts. And one of the first people I, I wanted to reach out to um, to get up to date on the status of, of some of these marine pieces that we've been talking about um, is Jim Carlton, who is a professor emeritus at Williams College. He is known as probably the leading marine invertebrate expert in the world. Invertebrates being soft-shelled animals like lepus barnacles, like a lot of the things that were found growing on pieces of debris, like the flapron and the other objects that, that we've been talking about. So... I reached out to Jim um, and I kind of brought myself up to speed with all of these pieces. And, you know, Andy, something we say a lot in this podcast is like the closer you look at the evidence, the stranger it gets. And what we're going to talk about today is just a perfect example of that. We're going to talk about some some MH370 evidence that's very well known around the world. But few people have looked at it in the kind of detail that really reveals the richness and the strangeness of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to to Jim. I talked to him earlier and we, we I, I made a video and we're going to sort of you and I are going to talk about my conversation with him. Right. So we can kind of set it up and contextualize it. Right. This is I'm also excited because a lot of things have been happening in the last couple of weeks, both <clears> in this case, but also with our podcast. So we're on episode 20, which blows my mind that we've almost. I mean, that's like almost six months of, of putting this thing together every single week. And we have now we've seen our traffic grow to the point where we are part of this YouTube program and we're able to monetize this podcast through ads. So you might hear some of them and we're also selling advertising, but we also have super members and people who can subscribe to the page and get more benefits than they could get before. The other thing is we're seeing about half of our traffic coming to the audio side of this thing, which is totally fine, but there are so many graphics and so many pieces of content that just make more sense in video. So if you're one of those people who is listening to the podcast instead of viewing it, we definitely recommend that they visit our show page at deepdivemh370.com. There are other ways to support us there as well. But I will tell you, Jeff, that this has also been kind of a frustrating week for me because our last episode was so deep and so mm. long and it left me with some questions. And I thought like, I think we kind of referenced this at the end of the last episode where I was like, I'm, I'm just frustrated. Right. And you feel like, a little confused. Yeah. You're that's like, why? Be because yeah. no, I mean, that's, that's part of, that's kind of the whole point of this podcast, right? Is that I'm way in too deep of my eyeballs and you're a normal person. <laughs> so together we can hopefully figure out how to talk about this in a way that makes sense to people. Yeah. So I, I welcome your confusion. I hope that I can um, right. so, clarify it. Yeah, but like I hope we I'm do... speaking for the viewer, you know? Exactly. So, but before we do that, I do want to say one thing, which is you mentioned people can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you can also subscribe um, at the show page. And if you do that, you will get emails notifying you. I don't know if there's an equivalent thing on YouTube, but I would love to know how you what, what do you do actually if you want to subscribe to the youtube channel is there a button or something yeah you there can are click buttons on? and there's a call to action in every description and in fact you will get early access to this podcast if you're one of these subscribers uh because 
as much as we make it seem like this thing is happening live, like in a perfect scenario, I, I get this thing done a little bit before Thursday at midnight. Okay. So uh, if you're if you're that into it and you want to uh, support us in that way, uh, yes, you do get a little bit of early access. I just kind of want to get this out of the way, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I've we have been, a lot to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, so this one might be a little bit long, but the thing that I can't wrap my head around, and you're right, it's because you eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff, and right. I'm fairly new to it. And there's so much information, and I got to assume that our, our readers and our, our listeners and our viewers are kind of going through the same thing. This this debris stuff is super important mm -hmm. in the overall story. But when I see pieces of debris that sometimes have barnacles on them, they sometimes don't have barnacles on them, and I want to just sort of follow your logic, but then right. I wonder, like, well, could they have like floated back into the water and gotten washed off or right. could some, when we talk about how as soon as they're dead, they get eaten by other marine life. Is that right. sort of like, and you're going to get into more detail about this, but is that, is that I making think, all of this stuff not really make the sense that it's supposed to make? Okay. It's, it's a really important question because this is the basis on which a lot of our understanding of what happened to the plane is going to rest on. And so let me just kind of just do a quick run through of how okay. it works. Okay. And you're going to hear, we're going to be talking about this kind of over and over again, because we're going to have to, we're kind of just going to lay layer upon layer of evidence. We're going to talk to a lot of marine biologists who are going to be telling us their version and they're going to be telling a slightly different versions. And so it's great that we all have the same foundation. And so this is how it works. <clears throat> you start with a piece, um, that hasn't been in the ocean before. It could be a piece of an airplane that's crashed into the ocean. It could be a, like a, a drinks cooler that fell off a boat. Um, it could be an oar that somebody dropped off the rowboat. Anything at all falls into the ocean and it starts to float. And there's little critters that live in the water that they li their lifestyle involves attaching themselves to what's called a substrate, something hard. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be that hard. It could be a floating piece of seaweed even, but it attaches to something and its lifestyle involves being attached to that thing. And essentially it will then spend as long as it, as much time as the good Lord gives it to float around and it's pulling other things out of the water and eating it. It will grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually it will reproduce. Um, and if it is an, is it, is an organism that has evolved to live in the open ocean, like Lepus anatifera, the gooseneck barnacle that we're spending a lot of time talking about, um, if it gets onto the shore, it will, it will not be happy and it will die. Basically, if these things wash ashore, um, they will get eaten by things like crabs and seagulls. And what will happen is a piece that has been, um, colonized by this creature and its brethren because when you're in the ocean uh if you're a critter living in the ocean that attaches to things it's very valuable real estate to have a thing to attach to so anything that spends any amount of time in the ocean boaters will know this especially people who have boats in the ocean yeah you, you'll you'll get all kinds of gunk growing on your on your on the bottom of your boat and so what we have is if you take a hundred objects and throw them in the water, you will see them all accumulating organisms. And these organisms, it's almost like the, the, the ecological succession in a forest that you've probably read or learned about in school, where it's like you get grass, and then you get little bushes, and then you get trees, and then you wind up eventually with oak trees, but that takes a really long time. So in the same way with, with stuff that floats in the ocean, you'll get little fuzz and brown stuff and, <clears throat> and, and slimy stuff. And eventually you'll get these magnificent long droopy lepus barnacles. Yeah. And so when these, so every, so, so you, you see the forest growing on this piece, then it washes ashore and then it gets stripped. And so if a piece has been in the water for five months, it comes ashore with a big healthy population that gets eaten. That piece is now bumping around in the intertidal zone. It's getting scraped and bumped on rocks and things. It might wash above the, the high water mark for a while, and then a storm will come or a rainstorm will wash it out to sea. It might float around for a little bit longer. It might, it might acquire a second population and then wash ashore again. Okay. And so does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I, this, I don't want to like oversimplify this, sure. but to me, the part that has been confusing is when I don't see barnacles on pieces, but in actuality, I think what you're saying is 
not seeing barnacles is less uh inter less notable than actually seeing barnacles right if they're gone that means that they were on land or that they were eaten but if you do see barnacles it means that something over time occurred to make them grow and be there there's typically two ways <clears throat> That, a, that an object doesn't have barnacles on it. The first one is that it just uh, just got into the water. Right. And the second one is that it had the barnacles and they got eaten off after it came ashore on land. Now, there's a, th a third possibility that, that is conceptually possible, which is that something like, while it was floating around, ate it. And I've heard sort of anecdotally stories about turtles eating these things, fish eating these things. There's certain kinds of... Um, other invertebrates called nudibranchs that eat them. And so it's it's conceptually possible for these things to get stripped at, at sea, but I have, but, but viewers and listeners will hear in the weeks to come from marine biologists who will tell us that that actually doesn't really happen too much. But typically, if you see a piece uh, that, ha that has five months worth of growth on it, it's been at sea for five months. It okay. wasn't, it didn't, it didn't spend a year at sea and get stripped halfway through. And that's okay. a very important distinction to make. Okay. All right. That's good enough for me. For now. Okay. I may have more questions later. But listen, it's a, again, it's a thing we can keep coming back to, keep coming back to. Something seems strange or odd. And there, the, here's the complicating factor, Andy. This is strange and odd. Stuff, these, these, we're going to find out that this debris that gets collected doesn't seem to have behaved yeah. in the way that pieces would, should have behaved. So, so, so we're going to definitely need to pause if, if listeners or viewers want to, you know, ask uh, questions in the comments here or at the show page, fire away. All right. All right. Last time we talked about the flaperon and the four other pieces that were found after it. We talked about how the Australian authorities they just struggled to make sense of all this stuff. Like how, right. how did it float from the seventh arc and then get to La Reunion? in the time that it did and right. they made they made models to like basically support their theory which i'm not a scientist but i think that's not really how you do it i think you make yeah. the you make the models then you look at the, the evidence as opposed to try to make it fit in but right that's neither well there was confusion there. i mean there was confusion from the get-go because from from right away when the french collected the flapper on la reunion and took it back to toulouse and examined it they they found a contradiction right which is that this barnacle was completely covered in barnacles, uh, which they said entre deux eaux. Yes. Which is how we started to speak oui. French, like crazy right. versions. And, and yet it, when they put it in the tank, it floated high and dry. And so I want to get into that actually a little bit more right now. I want to, ex because I really want to clarify and make sure everyone is exactly on the same page with this, why this is so weird. Okay. Yeah. And before you even do that, yeah. then the other part of it is this piece that wound up in Mosul Bay at the southern tip of south africa which is also like that doesn't match any that's of a whole stuff. nother um yeah that's a whole but different bunch of right. uh, weirdnesses i'm we gonna hang back and let that. you monologue jeff because this is your this is your zone <laughs> have at it i love it when people say that to me um okay so as you know <laughs> it's more french <laughs> vas-y um allons-y okay um lepus barnacles attach themselves to floating objects we know that yes um, and they attach themselves to the underwater part. And we're going to put some pictures up on the screen. We'll have it on the show page as well. We're going to see how piece, they float. The part that's above the water doesn't have lepus on it. The piece that's underwater has lepus on it as attached to it because they get their, their, they breathe and they get their food from the water. Not hard to understand. Now, as we were saying, when the flower pond washed ashore, the, the authorities couldn't figure out where the water line was because it was covered all over, including um, on the trailing edge. Now, I, I want to direct people's attention particularly, and this is where, I'm sorry, um, audio-only listeners, I'm going to have to sort of describe it to you. The part of the, of the, of the flaperon that is furthest from the front of the wing, the backmost part, part of it got ripped off, but the part of the trailing edge that remained was fully covered in barnacles. And I, I, we have um, a picture of the entire flaperon and, yep. the, and with, the, with this sort of rearmost part facing us. I've circled part of it in green and part of it in blue. And if you zoom in, you see that there's quite healthy, dense populations of lepus attached here in both of these places. Now, what did the French see when they took it to Toulouse? Well, they put it in a tank 
and they they ultimately wound up publishing some images um and as you can see they found that it floated either upside down or right side up and it wasn't that hard to flip it was a, a, a relatively wavy condition would easily flip it back and forth but no matter which way it floated the trailing edge was out of the water it was high and dry and we have, again, pictures showing it floating high and dry. And when the uh, Australians did the same thing with this, um, remember this spare flapper on that the, uh, the Americans gave them, and they cut it down so that it resembled the, the, the one found on La Réunion, uh, it floated the same way. And they ultimately published pictures of it. So you can see with your own eyes, this thing floating with the, the trailing edge sticking high and dry out of the water, okay? So how do we reconcile this information? Um, and yeah. so this is, I would argue, a core mystery of the MA370 disappearance because what we know is that when this piece washed ashore on La Reunion, it had a fresh population of barnacles that had been in the water. Now we're getting into a separate question, but how do you know how old Alipus is? You can study populations and there's various papers that we'll be referring to and we'll be talking to more experts about this, but you can get a rough idea of how old they are by how big they are. And based on how big these ones, ones were, they were probably anywhere between one month and six months old. That's the kind of the extreme range that I've been cited. I, can we just tell people why this matters? I mean, in case it's not super duper obvious by now. <laughs> Okay, so we have a piece that washed, that comes to La Réunion, La Réunion. It has clearly been, the trailing edge has been submerged for the last, say, four months. And yet, if you put it in the water, these pieces will stick up out. How, is, how do you reconcile the fact that on the one hand, it seems to have been floating totally submerged, and on the other hand, it doesn't want to float submerged? Something must have been holding it down. Yeah, and we're going to. And so this is this isn't just me saying it. We're going to talk to the world's leading expert on marine invertebrates right now. And he's going to he's going to answer my questions about it. Before we do that, though, I do want to take a quick break for our interstitial and we'll be right back. Episode 20 is brought to you by Finished MKE. This is a guy I've known for a long time and he's a big fan of the podcast. His name is Matt Larson. And what this business does is they redesign, rejuvenate, upgrade old crappy homes in other words they will buy houses in need of repair they'll start at the foundation and design a home that when a person moves in they can basically have like zero worries for the next 15 years that's a lot of time he's actually helped me on my own house he's got an excellent sense of style and design finish mke says that they create a modern living space but they also buy properties and sell properties so you can rest assured that when you buy a home that Finnish MKE has rehabbed and rejuvenated, it's going to be awesome. Matt says that if his mom wouldn't be comfortable there, then uh, he doesn't want anything to do with it. Uh, they will also buy your crappy house, uh, or if you like inherited a property, or you were like a property manager for a bunch of different properties, and you don't want to do that anymore, Finnish MKE is the company to call. Of course, despite their name, Finished MKE, they also are set up to work nationally and internationally. So if that sounds like something that might be interesting to you, you should check them out on all the social platforms. We'll put up a link on there. Also, what I like is this link to this how to replace your own toilet video that Matt and I made a few years ago. It's funny. He doesn't take himself too seriously. He likes to have fun, and he makes good stuff. So thanks again to Finished MKE for sponsoring episode 20 of Deep Dive MH370. Now, Jim, one of the things, major things he did with his career was study uh, this population of debris that was washed ashore from Japan in 2011 by the great tsunami. And it, all this junk was washed out to shore, and in the years that followed, it washed ashore um, on the on the coast of Oregon, Washington, and, and so forth. And by looking at them, they could see the patterns. They could see where the patches of ocean that this stuff floated through. They could see that stuff that went north um, gained this kind of um, li life form, and the ones that went south gained a different kind. And so they basically, Jim was able to formulate this idea of what he called bioforensics. It's like yeah. trying to deduce this, the story of this piece based on, by comparing it to the other pieces, you see the commonalities, you see the differences, you see how they all drifted across the ocean from Japan, but some of them took different paths. Jim Carlton, you are really one of the most renowned marine biologists in the world. You specialize in invertebrates, is that accurate? 
Uh, the invertebrates part, I don't know about the most renowned. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the most renowned. Um, and and so you have uh, you have for many years uh, been a professor of marine sciences at Williams College. Yes. In your career, you coined a term bioforensics, and I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that means. Yeah, bioforensics, um, we use that word to examine, um, in this case, uh, it's widely applicable, but um, to um, examine a rafting object and look at the species on it and see if whether, um, if see if w whether the species on an object can tell us both the path it took and uh, where it came from. Okay. So for instance, uh, when all this stuff got dumped into the ocean in Japan, um, they, so if you have some kind of floatable terrestrial object, yes. Um, it yes. might be like a cooler say, yes. And it floats and it starts to float and, and, and it's now a terrestrial thing. It's now in a Marine environment. Indeed. And what happens to something that, okay, it never had any marine organisms on it before. Nope. Now it does. And what is it, what starts to happen to it as it goes? So a lot of the, using the, <clears throat> using the uh, 2011 tsunami as an example, um, a lot of that debris, the debris that either didn't get washed back ashore or that sank in Japan, a lot of that debris resided in the coastal waters of Japan long enough to acquire Japanese species. They settled on those objects and then those objects would be engaged. They had different paths around Japan, but eventually many of them got engaged with currents that were going north and uh, east. So as they traveled across the ocean, then they, they gain oceanic species, not Japanese species, okay. but oceanic species. When they land in North America, they have combination of species from Japan and the species picked up en route before landing. And on some cases, but rare, if those objects resided long enough along the Pacific coast of North America, and we thought that was fairly transient before they landed, they would pick up a few uh, American species. I see. And one of the things we've talked about in the podcast before uh, is that when things float, they tend to, there's kind of a, a broad scale tendency, you know, called currents that take things along more or less the same route. There's kind of a, what you'd call sort of a dominant tendency, but there's also a certain kind of randomness within the current so that pieces will still follow different paths. Yes. And I think we, we talked in the past, you and I, about how when stuff got washed into the ocean in Japan, some of it wound up going on a more northerly route and some of it found a more southerly path. And so, th so would it be accurate to say that when you look at, uh, when you look at stuff that's been floating for months or years, you, 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 you see similarities, but also differences and the differences allow you to sort of discriminate sort of like a sub, a sub story within the larger story. I would say that as we, as we um, study objects that have been at sea for years, the, um, the mysteries increase mm. um, um, and uh, and it's uh, extraordinarily hard to predict some exact path of length of residency while while rafting, while drifting. Yeah, but yeah, so the overall pattern was, this stuff was from the tsunami zone. That was bioforensics. That was okay. these, these species that we found on the debris told us, said to us, we are from basically north of Tokyo, south of Hokkaido. It was sort of a biological fingerprint um, that was a huge help. The other huge help was whenever possible, if this stuff had registration numbers, we work with the consulate of Japan. And yes, that boat was lost on March 11, 2011 from right. a particular city. Yeah. So you're, you're using the mix of species that you're finding because some of them are endemic to Japan. Some of them might be endemic to certain latitudes within the open Pacific, yep. et cetera. And you're seeing these sort of patterns again and again and again, and yes. each, each piece might have its own idiosyncrasies, but you're seeing a kind of general yes. trend of species, et cetera. And also the growth because these, there've been a lot, there's been a lot of papers done on lepus growth rates. They're not always yeah. consistent. They often disagree, yeah. but there seems to be an overwhelming sense that 
we kind of can get a sense of how long how 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 long these things have been in the water. When the scientists at the ATSB, which were in charge of finding this missing airplane, uh, when they did their drift modeling, and they had pretty sophisticated drift modeling, they had sort of um, very time specific wind and and wave uh, information. Yeah. Some of it derived from satellite and so forth, and they used drifters and etc. So they had some pretty good environmental information to plug into their models. They were they had a really hard time making it work. They couldn't get it to they couldn't get it to a reunion in the fifteen months that they had, and so they what they went to the length of actually getting a real flapper on, cutting it down so that it matched the damage that had uh, been observed. Yeah. Then they got it to work because of the windage. Um, but this leads us to kind of a pair the really kind of central and to me fascinating paradox of the flapper on, which is I sent you some pictures yep. of the lepus that were found growing on this thing on the, especially on the trailing edge. Yeah. Um, and, and the way it floated doesn't really match what you would expect given the really healthy, uh, growth of these underwater organisms. Yeah, it was and that, that again, um, just for clarification. That was because there were lepus on part of the flaperon, and that part of flaperon would not submerge in these right. tanks. Right. right. So when they put it in the tank, or yeah. where they when they put the, when they put the real piece in the tank, or when they put the replicate in yeah. the ocean, yeah. it would it was sort of bi-stable. It would flip. It would be, it would be the right side up or upside down, and it didn't take a lot of energy to flip it. But in neither orientation was, was the trailing edge underwater. Yeah. So. Um, I, I, what I see, what I wondered whether or not is that there was more, more to the laparon than, than was seen when it washed ashore. Right. Um, it looks like on the edge of the object, it's ragged. It looks mm -hmm. like there are connections. And I would imagine if you take that thing off a plane, you could take other parts of the plane with it. Right. Or however, it breaks apart. And so, um, I'm, I would simply guess it was, it was, all underwater, and by the time it landed, uh, it landed um, parts the parts that were holding it down, mm. sort of like ballast, simply were gone, and that that part expressed itself above water. Um, so um, I don't think it's very much of a mystery. It seems very logical that that for part of its life it was underwater. So, and not only just for part of its life, but it would have had to be held underwater up until right before it came ashore, because these organisms were alive, it seems, or at least fresh. Yeah, I couldn't tell that. Um, you can find a very, an old, very dried thing on a beach with lepus that looked pretty good. Mm. We would have had to have on-site, on-site testimony that these guys were, that the stalk was fleshy and there was still tissue inside the barnacle. But right. if it was, if it was, if it landed in a gentle way, and they were simply being baked and mummified on a beach. So when you talk about being attached to something else, it would, the only thing it attaches to is obviously the wing itself. The wing is also a fairly high buoyancy object. And it's not impossible to imagine um, the, the wing, the, the sort of flapper and being attached to the wing, and then the wing maybe banging ashore on La Reunion and, and, and getting you know banged off. Of course, then that kind of raises the question of what happened to the wing that, that it also didn't get discovered, but who knows? I mean, there's just. Yeah, stuff sits on beaches for an awful long time and not discovered. Depends how remote the beach is, right? Um, how often it's visited. Again, I'll go back to a model that whether or not it could have come ashore somewhere for a while, then been, been, been released by another storm. How right. long was it between, how many months had passed between the, the day of disappearance and the time it was found on reunion? It was 15 months, so it was it was it had to kind of go straight, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And and what's interesting about the, what we're talking about, it's fascinating to me that like, this hasn't really been discussed before because it does again change. You, now we don't know anymore what the windage is because we know that this piece actually. What, it seems like what you're telling me is that this piece could not have floated from the impact site in this configuration. Um, unless. Something else happened along the way um, to weigh it down. Um, we can we can clearly go with the model that if lepus is attached to an object, it it was underwater. There's, okay. there's, that's not a debate. Many many boats that came from Japan 
uh, they arrived upside down, mm -hmm. and there's there's the water line. The 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 the, the um the bottom of the boat is exposed to air. Mm -hmm. All around the boat, there are huge lepus colonies right exactly at the water line where the water is going up and down. But a couple inches above that, whenever the boat is dry, there are no lepus. They will die. They'll desiccate. They have to be underwater. Right. So we know that. So, But yeah. I want to just kind of nail this down because I think this is like the, the, the nut of, of what the take home here is this. There's various different stories that we can tell to explain what we see. But what we can say is that this piece did not float in this configuration from the impact zone. This plane did, this piece did not float like this across the Indian Ocean. Uh, unless, as I said, um, if, if the moment, the moment it got, the moment it was at the surface, mm -hmm. um, picture day one, whatever, mm -hmm. um, there's a slight complication to that, which is we don't know if the plane was on the sea floor. We don't know how long it took the flapper on to be released from the plane debris. Okay, to um, be sure, to be sure, unless, but but even if it, it left on impact, right? To be sure, but how? But but what is clear is that this piece did not float in this configuration. Now, other configurations are possible to be sure, but in this configuration, it did not float like this across the ocean in this configuration. Unless, unless when it got when it got to the when it yeah. expressed itself on the surface, it was in the configuration seen on when it landed. Okay. But somewhere along the way, it got involved with some fishing nets that pulled it down, permitted the lepus to colonize on top of that otherwise exposed surface. Yeah. For a while, then got freed of the net and re-expressed itself with the exposed part. But that would be not being in this configuration. That's what I'm saying. Like in this, it did not float like yeah. this. You're saying it could have floated differently, but it could not have floated like this, if that makes sense. Um, there's no, there's no way. It just can't float exposed like this. It can't grow on in the open air. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It could float exposed, but wouldn't have lepus on it. Okay. So because it did have lepus on it, we know that it didn't float in this configuration. At some point, at some point, it was underwater. That's right. Now, I can't say, well, I don't know that we can say, when it was underwater that's a really good question how long right. if you're at sea for 50 months right. can you be partly exposed and partly underwater part of the time why would something that is usually above the water the corner of the flapper on right be un uh, be underwater part of the time it's got to be weighed down by something it's really interesting what jim says i i think that you might see sense that i was trying to get him to say it more clearly he's a scientist he doesn't like to say things like journalists like to say things like in headlines yeah that's not his thing it's not his thing but what he's basically saying is that this piece could not have floated across the ocean with the you know in this configuration it with the with the with the leading edge uh, the sorry the trailing edge sticking up it just is physically impossible lepus do not grow in the air so something must have been holding it down i like how you pointed out to me that scientists aren't really in the business of making pronunciations like this um but the other thing you said to me is that these individual guests and these individual experts aren't privy to all the information that is both in your head and published and what we've been speaking about for 20 episodes right so he probably when he do, he doesn't have the spoof scenario in front of him he doesn't have the sdu stuff he just knows what he knows and can still show these irregularities that don't make sense but this whole mystery it only it really only becomes more clear when you look at the totality of it as opposed to the individual weird scenarios okay when you there, look at the debris from mh370 the the, uh, the the pieces that were collected were handed over to Australian scientists who looked at them carefully, and they found some really baffling patterns. Basically, none of the organisms that they found on these pieces matched what you would expect to see from a plane that had gone down a year and a half to two years before. Nothing was that old, and this mix of species wasn't right, especially on the piece that was collected by Blaine Allen Gibson uh, in February of 2015, as we talked about in last episode. This had things living on it, but it had very few things that lived in the open ocean. 
Um, and it had, and of the things that did live in the open ocean, none of them were more than two months old. And the only things that were a little bit older than that, there were, there were two organisms that were, that were like eight months old. And these were things that only lived in, in, um, coastal areas. They only live about 50 to hundred miles from the coast. So knowing that this plane crashed in the remote Indian ocean, which is nowhere near any land. How did it pick up these coastal species and why didn't it pick up any of these uh, open ocean species? Um, so this is what I asked um, uh, Jim next. So this piece washed ashore in July of 2015. It had been 15 months and then some time passed and nothing else washed up and people were starting to scratch their heads. And then a whole bunch of other pieces started to show up all at once. Okay. And the and in the final report that uh, the ATSB put out in 2017, they actually talked in quite some detail about these things. And I think I've shared some of this with you in the past. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of these things in terms of like what was on them and when they arrived. So what are, what were these other pieces? Are they, they were confirmed as part of the plane? Yes. They all were confirmed. To, some of them had serial numbers on them, and some of them just sort of matched the materials and the and the other. Like, okay, so the first piece that was that became publicly known was called No Step. It was a triangular piece um, that was it was a um, it was a fragment of a horizontal stabilizer, and this was a really interesting piece because when it showed up, it didn't look like it had anything on it. Um, presumably it had spent some time ashore, got picked clean and then got rewashed out. Um, and, but when they looked at it carefully, they found organisms kind of tucked into the nooks and crannies. It has, it's an internal kind of honeycomb structure. It's very yummy for plate pieces to hide out and yep. be happy. Yep. That's very common. Yep. Okay. So, but it was interesting because when they looked at these, um, when they looked at this. They found all the different species, they identified them. And two thirds of them, I'm, I'm sort of reading from the reporter, two thirds of the species, um, they only live close to shore and could not have been picked up in the open sea. And then this is something I want to talk to you. So this is, I'm quoting here, the natural habitat of the recovered mollusks is shallow water on clean coral sand or in seagrass meadows. None of them could or would ever attach to drifting debris. So maybe we can talk about the difference between what is it? Benthic and pelagic is the term of art. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how. If they wouldn't attach to the debris, how did they get on the debris? Well, there was a there was a question of were they attached to the debris? The only way the investigators could make sense of this was to assume that it had picked up the shells of these creatures from the sand because these things, like their shells, live in the sand or something. I mean, it's a mystery, frankly. Um, they're either, and, and, they're either attached or they're not. I mean, you can, okay. you can, you can have a piece of debris ru washing back and forth on a sandy beach, but the stuff in the sand is not going to cement itself onto the debris. Right. Okay. So this is a true mystery. And then one third of the mollusks found on item three could plausibly have attached in the open water, um, but they were all juveniles of approximately two months old. And this is where, I, this is the thing I was emailing you earlier. Only two specimens from item three a sea snail of the species Petaloconchus renisectus yes. and a tube worm of the genus Vernaliopsis yes. okay, look to be more than two months old. The former appears to be six to eight months old, the latter eight to 12 months old. And these, now, now this is where you can correct me. Uh, both are usually found living on the seabed. Petaloconchus is only rarely found on floating debris and Vernaliopsis never is according to this or according to someone I talked to, I can't remember. Um, so how does you, how do you, I, I, before we get too deep into it, Jim, what, yeah. so some things live in the open ocean and some things live like on the coast, on the coast or on the seabed or something. Same thing. Okay. Same thing. So, so, um, yeah, I, um, it's not really much of a mystery. If I, if, um, if we take a, a, a plastic bucket and throw mm -hmm. it into Long Island Sound, mm -hmm. It's clean. It's from the terrestrial environment, um, and it floats long enough at the surface. The larvae of species that are in the water column will attach to the bucket. Right there, it is. Now, where are these larvae from? Some of them are from the seashore, the intertidal zone. 
Some of them could be benthic species that are living at 20, 30, 40 feet below um, um, uh, on the floor of Long Island Sound. And they're looking to attach to a hard substrate. Okay. Um, and, and the fact that it's a floating object, um, I don't, these larvae do not have a, generally a, a very high GPA. And um, so we're, they're attaching to a, a solid substrate. Um, Vermiliopsis is um, going to be a, a worm that's common in shallow waters, mm -hmm. whether it's intertidal or shallow waters. It produces larvae. Those larvae swim around and they'll attach to stuff. Mm -hmm. so in this case, they attach to this part of the plane that was floating along. Where those larvae came from, we don't know what population of Vermiliopsis produce those larvae, presumably this is a species widespread through the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. So it's not a surprise, a, a ton of stuff can be found on rafting debris that has never previously been reported on rafting debris, but that's an artifact of how much stuff we've looked at, not an artifact of like, oh my gosh, uh, what's this thing doing on a, on a raft? Right. So larvae attached to it, there it is. Now, do the larvae of Remiliopsis produced from the coastal zone or Petalaconcus. Do they go 50 miles out at sea? Do they go 100 miles out to sea? Where are those little suckers floating around? Mm. In general, we don't often know that, how far out to sea. The general model is, if I'm talking to my students, if you are a shallow water species that lives along the seashore in 10 or 20 feet of water, you have the misfortune of your larvae being picked up by an ocean current and you're heading out to sea a few hundred miles and you're probably dead because what in the heck are you going to attach to out there mm. you're not a deep sea species you're not going to sink down to the deep sea floor um, you may find a piece of drift algae but whatever but in this case um, it's your lucky day you find some piece of marine debris to settle on now, how far, what, when did it acquire that marine debris? Unless we think the piece of the pieces of the plane actually floated along the coastline within a few hundred feet, the larvae obviously were acquired somewhere, I would guess within miles of a shoreline, but who knows. And this is where it gets puzzling because as you said, for these, if these pieces are, let's say eight months old, um, then that means that eight months ago, uh, the piece must have been near some kind of shoreline. And that becomes problematic because if you're near the seventh arc, the nearest thing to the north is the Cocos Islands. Uh, and, the, and, the, and then you, if you go a little further west, you get Diego Garcia. And then there's nothing, literally nothing until Rodriguez. And it gets pretty problematic as to where this thing could have picked this stuff up. Yeah, you know, we would dream about having a um, GPS, a, um, a tracker on it. And right. Is, if we had had a tracker, it would be like one of those cartoon characters in one of those Sunday cartoons where it's a little a little kid going like this from the playground to the candy yeah. store. And like Family like, Circus. Yes, nobody's exactly. nobody's going to remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Exactly. Family Circus where it shows the little kid yeah. wandering all over. He's going he's going from school to home. Right. And he, he just, the route he describes, it's not a straight route, but he describes every possible path. In fact, in some cases, he goes back for a while and goes forward. So, I, you know, I don't know how whoever did that, I don't know how they estimated the age of the worm. Right. Group. Right. Or the age of the uh, snail probably probably knew, knew what they were doing. I'm sure these are these are good folks down there, um, but again, um, um, evidence over and over again suggests often a circuitous path. But again, you you need time to take a circuitous path, and I think if you're looking at the amount of time that elapsed before this thing got to Mozambique, where yeah. it was discovered, it can't dither and dally too much, and uh, it does, and and also just the lack of any deep water species. While you and and at the same time you've got these shallow water species, it's I mean it, it is puzzling, no? The the lack of deep water species may simply mean that the deep water larvae are not at the surface. 
So just to clarify what Jim is saying, uh, he's saying that in order for no step to have these organisms that are eight months old and only live in the sh close to the shore, the piece must have somehow been near a shore. Yeah, and, I'm looking at this map, yeah. Jeff, and there just aren't any shores out there. This is yeah. like a, a giant, expansive piece of ocean. Well, there's a there's sort of on there the margins a, a possibility. So if you look at this map uh, on the far right, there is um, a sort of the, the white tracks are really dense because that's where they all start. This is we've they've sort of this is from the simulations that the uh, Australians did. And you're seeing these pieces start in a very tight cluster and basically get carried by the currents first to the northeast and then north and then curving around to the west. And those two green circles are 100 mile circles around Cocos Island and Diego Garcia. And so that's about how close you have to get to these bodies of land to pick up these coastal species. And you can see that like there are a few of them just barely kind of go in that area. It's possible, but it's not that likely. And then they kind of get carried swiftly westward. It seems less likely that you're going to hit Diego Garcia. And then those those yellow circles, the easternmost one is Rodriguez, the middle one is La Reunion, and the western westernmost one is Villanculos, where no step came from. I've never heard of the Cocos Islands. I have heard of Diego Garcia. And once again, that is one of those places that the conspiracy theorists kind of Latch yeah, into. we probably oh. have talked about it enough already. But um, the point just being that it's it's not impossible to come up with a story for how this piece got these weird species on it, but it kind of requires everything to line up perfectly, and it leaves a lot of unanswered questions, like how come it doesn't have any lepus? Um, I mean, maybe they got chewed up and eaten off because clearly this piece is is doesn't have the kind of rich array of, of life on it. It probably has spent some time ashore. Um, so that might not be the best example, but it's, it's, it's a little bit weird. Yeah. And then, so this is the next thing you asked Jim about was what, what I mentioned earlier, this right. Mosul Bay piece, the, the Roy piece. Right. It washed ashore at the Southern tip of South Africa, not long after the Flapron. Right. Right. So it's only a few months after Flapron. One of the mysteries of Mosul Bay is uh, how did it get that far uh, in that short amount of time? And um, so this is something that, that we talked to Jim about. There was a piece that washed to shore. This was a really, this is one of the really puzzling pieces. It has a whole weird story. It was found in Mossel Bay. Yeah. And Ooh. when yeah. the, the Australian authorities who did the drift modeling for the Flapron, they spent a lot of time trying to figure out the Flapron drift modeling and they finally made it make sense. But then when they looked at the Mossel Bay, they're just, we have no idea how this got this far. It's at the Southern tip of South Africa. I know where it is. Yeah. yeah. And so, and the and other weird thing about it, it was discovered or it was, um, yeah, it was found in like a February or March of 2016. But then once somebody went, there was a local newspaper stories about it. And another local person said, oh, I saw that three months ago. And I took a picture of it. And so they came forward and it, and so it must have like, so we, so this is a perfect example of how a thing can wash ashore full of all kinds of yummy, juicy, fleshy marine life. Yeah. And then it gets kind of washed out because maybe got taken up the river, some muskrats chewed on it or what have you, meerkats, I don't know. And then it gets washed back out, gets washed back in. And then it winds up pretty much in the same place that it started three months ago, just like this family circus. And it's been stripped clean. But because this picture existed, um, there's actually, you can see a very healthy population of lepus. Again, I did my kind of rough and ready image analysis, and it looks like these things are about two and a half centimeters long in the, in the um, capitulum, yep. which again is, is, is actually about the same size as I did. I did. I did image analysis on the Flapron, and I came to about two and a half centimeters. When the French had it, this is another mystery. You and I have discussed this as well. The French, if you look at pictures, to me it looks like they're about two and a half centimeters. The French took it to Toulouse. They said, "Oh no, there's they're up to three point six. But of course, you need to do to get to find the three point six one. You need to look all over to find the yeah. best ones, right? Yeah, yeah. The ones that they turned over for. Um, a chemical analysis, which is a whole nother story. I'm not even going to get into right now, Yeah, but they, they, the ones they turn over were like two and a half centimeters. Um, 
So maybe if you if you do image analysis and it looks like two and a half, maybe they get up to three point six. You're just missing it. But the, but the point was they that seem they seem to be of a similar kind of age population, but none of them match fifteen months uh, of going in the water. Yeah, yeah. Earlier generations can come and go. So if they have thirty six centimeter um, or nearly forty centimeter lepas, that might those were probably the ones that first settled. Right. Those are gone for some reason. Fish got them, and then and then. The, what we saw was a second or third generation of lepus. Possibly. I mean, I've t I've I, I've been talking to other people who specialize in lepus, and they seem to be of the opinion that um, for a, for a piece to have a lepus population and then lose it entirely is not really something you expect to see in the open ocean per se. It has more to maybe if it gets a sh shore, lepus are incredibly vulnerable. They get picked clean really fast. Yes. But in the open ocean, there are predators who specialize in lepus. Yes. But they'll take they'll take out individuals. Unless they won't the wipe object, out. Right. Unless the object flips over. Unless the object flips over. Um, but so you know, one of the things that that you know scientists have to deal with as they're trying to make sense of the world is is is, is ideas like evidence that's consistent with yeah. a conclusion or evidence that proves. A conclusion, right. and um, there's right. nothing that really proves. I mean, and I want to keep talking about some other pieces, but there's nothing we've come, we haven't come across anything so far that proves that this piece went into the water where we think it went into the water. Um, we, we haven't even found evidence that's consistent with it going into the water when we when and where we think it did, and 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 there's nothing that's consistent. There's nothing that proves that it didn't. But there's nothing that's consistent with that either. We certainly know it was floating. We know that. There's no question about that because it has lepus on it. Right. Lepus don't lie. So again, this problem that we keep on hammering on about, which is that you would expect all of these pieces should have marine life on it that is 15 months to two years old, depending on which piece being found when. And that's not what we find. In fact, none of these pieces have anything older than eight months old. None of the oceanic species are, are more than a couple months old. And so taken together, the totality of the evidence looked at together is even more puzzling than any one of the pieces looked at individually. I mean, even that piece on Rodriguez Island, that the biggest barnacle there was only 20 millimeters, which means it's... The, not any older than 105 days. Right. What does, and, what does Jim have to say? And so, about I mean, this? You, you can imagine that, that, that it's not hard at all to imagine a piece washing ashore and getting eaten clean. We saw it with the Mossel Bay piece. But all of them, all of them, and this happened to, and then they washed out to shore and spent months back at sea. It's, it's, the pattern is a little baffling. But this is, and I asked Jim about this. Now, Jim, you looked at uh, Japanese tsunami debris. And we, we posed the kind of um, philosophical question earlier, like if you didn't know that there had been a, a tsunami in Japan in 2011, you, you might not have known that. But, but if someone came to you, you say you had, say you've been collecting all this debris and um, someone had said, hey, I've got an idea. I'm going to hypothesize that there was a tsunami in Japan in 2011 is the has the debris that you've collected consistent with that? Is there do you are you seeing evidence that would be considered like the age of the barnacles, the species? Would you say that there's stuff on these debris that's that would disprove what I'm saying, or at least isn't not not that it would disprove it, but that is that at least is consistent with that? Sure. I mean, if we had a species, if we had something raft in and land in California, and it had on it. Um, a species only known from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, there was some event in Vietnam mm -hmm. that sent that to sea. We know the right. source. Uh, we could look at what's on. We could look at that organism and say, "Can we guess how?" how is that you or? I think that's on my end. What, oh, it's noon. That's our noon horn. <laughs> um, the, Don't ask um, me why. Um, and we can say. Can we, um, uh, we've established it's a Vietnamese species. How old is it would be the next question. Right. We might say, you know, 
it could be it could be five years or older. Okay. It could be no more than one year old. Right. Things like that. And that's yeah. how we would bet we would we would back into the story. Absolutely. Right. And you know, that's mostly what we do with debris. The March 11, 2011 event was extremely rare. Right. Here, was a, here was an episode where we knew both the time and date of inoculation into the ocean. Right. But mostly when I find stuff washed ashore, and I've been on beaches all over the world looking for cool marine debris with stuff on it, right. um, I generally, uh, I, I have to guess, is it, if, uh, if they are local species, we can go to Hawaii mm -hmm. and find Hawaiian species on marine debris. Right. So this stuff went into the went into the ocean, Hawaii, and it floated around and landed back on a beach. Yeah. Other stuff, it's it's just a guess. Where were you? How long have you been out there? And that sort of thing. So yeah. it's it's rare when we have such a luxury of knowing exactly when and where an object could have gone in the ocean, uh, like pieces of this plane. I mean, I guess sort of what I'm trying to ponder about is this idea that we have a population of, of articles that we know came from the plane. Some of them we strongly su suspect and some of them we just know outright. And yet of this population of objects, none of them has any evidence that is consistent with an impact in the search area at the time mm -hmm. that it, the crash uh, presumably occurred. And I, I think that's remarkable, actually. And I think it's it's worth noting how unusual that is. And and you're basing that on the uh, age of what was the age of the, the age of the lepus. I mean, again, you're, there's unknowns. We don't know. Obviously, it's like entirely possible that these things because of the water temperature and the nutrient density yeah. that they all just grew much more slowly, even than pieces that were known to cross the ocean around the same time. And listen, there's 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 innocent explanations for things, but I think it's worth noting that there is a, an apparent discrepancy that's worth drawing so, so, a line under. So, so, Jeff, if those 36 millimeter lepus those could those could put the impact, the place, the uh, the, the guesstimated impact site. Um, in theory, those could could put it back at the search area. There seems to be some controversy about that, but I mean, how old is that thirty six millimeter sucker? Well, and again, the, the, and, and this is this is you've 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 I have have pointed out the 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 annoyingness of this, I, that wasn't your word, but it's like the French have this very crucial piece of evidence and the, all they're showing us is the two and a halves. Yeah. Why are they, why are they keeping, I actually just got friended on LinkedIn with a guy who, who um, did the, who has inspected this piece. He works yeah. for the French uh, media agency. So maybe I'll find an answer. I'm going to try, but it's, 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 it's a lot more puzzling than, than a, an event that's so well-defined and so understood like with a tsunami event, it all the pieces line up. Yes. There's always there's pieces that are you know outliers, yes. but the mass of the data conforms with what's known. In this case, it doesn't seem to be so clean cut. I want to thank Jim Carlton again for his his taking the time. I, his his he is the leading expert on marine invertebrates, um, so I'm really grateful to him. But you know, taken all together, you know what it means is that it just doesn't look like these pieces floated from the search zone in the seventh arc. There's nothing about these pieces that, that indicates or would suggest that that's the case. And obviously, given that I also have, believe that their spoof scenario is possible, you have to ask yourself, is the totality of this debris evidence that the plane crashed in the Southern Indian Ocean, or rather, is it evidence that it didn't crash in the Southern Indian Ocean? Yeah, and more specifically, the fact that neither any of the authorities nor the media has drawn any attention to this, it's kind of baffling to me. But just as a person who is listening to these interviews and has been following this, the question is, did somebody drop this debris and let it show up where it showed up and it right. didn't actually float there? Yeah. I mean, I think what, what we're hearing again and again, and we talked to marine biologists, like even to suggest that like this, this stuff might have been planted is kind of anathema. I mean, it's, it's start, it starts to sound like conspiracy theories. But like the idea of 
putting a piece of something in the water and letting it stew for a couple months and then putting it on a shore is not challenging technically. It just it takes, it takes a little work. It doesn't really take any brain power. In fact, if this was planted, it wasn't planted with a lot of brain power because it doesn't seem like a lot of effort was made to create pieces whose marine life is really very convincing. Um, but people don't want to be on the conspiracy train. And so what we have in front of us is if we want to really make a case that this stuff is weird, we're going to have to talk to a lot of marine biologists, try to get a lot of opinions. And I can't, I can't make someone say, oh, this piece couldn't have floated in this configuration, but I can get them to say that like, it would have to have been held down by something, which is, you know, essentially the same. He doesn't know. So basically, you know, to recap what Jim said, this, this piece could not have floated the way that the Australians assume based all the drift modeling on. It must have okay. been attached to something else. It must have been, it was held underwater, whether by accident or by design, it was held underwater. And that is not something that anybody really has grappled with. And frankly, the ATSB has just not dealt with it at all. I feel a little less confused than I did at the beginning of this episode. So thank you. Okay. And thanks, Jim. I mean, that guy was, yeah. that guy was good for taking his time. Amazing. He's an emeritus professor we're that talking he is. to more people too. Okay. So as we wrap up episode 20, this one was a doozy. They're all, many of them are doozies, but they're becoming more so because- They're going to get doozier. They're doozier and doozier because we are getting closer and closer to the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of MH370. And Andy, wait, I want to tell you one more thing. Okay. This is stuff you will not hear anywhere else. Certainly doesn't seem like reporting, it. We are doing reporting that no one else is doing. And I think other people should be doing it, but they're not. And, and anybody can look, go find your own marine biologist, show him pictures of the flapron, ask him, do, bar, do lepus like to grow sticking a foot out of the water and ask them what they think. Um, but, you know, it's a mystery. You might have it. If you have another explanation, put it in the comments. I want to hear about it. This is why I told you this guy's a joie de vivre because this is the most exciting, <laughs> excited I've seen Jeff in a long time. And I've known him for a while and we talk all the time. So do him a favor, please. And like, and subscribe to this podcast and do leave those comments because we are reading them every single day and the numbers are growing. So obviously you might be watching this on YouTube. You might be listening to it on Apple podcasts or Spotify. Uh, we're partial to the YouTube one because that's, that's the one that takes the most work. Um, Anyway, we'll be back in one week for episode 21 as we turn the corner on the, <laughs> into the 20s on this episode, on this podcast. We're coming up on the 10th anniversary, and, th and there's stuff that the world really needs to know about for this case. All right, we're going to tell them. I'm going to tell it to them. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks to Jim. Thanks to our, our viewers and our listeners. You've been watching Deep Dive MH370. Episode 20, Bringing in the Experts. This episode was brought to you by Finished MKE, and our title music was composed by Jacob John. We'll see you next time.